Hey guys, welcome to Unlocking Your Book Live. Are you overthinking writing your book? Maybe you're putting too much thought into that process. Stay tuned as we're going to dive in with a couple of members and help them stop overthinking and get their book unlocked. Stay tuned. Here we go. It's time for the show. Hello, Dr. Nelson. How are you? Hello. I'm good. How are you? <laughs> I'm fantastic, actually. I'm feeling quite splendid today. Uh, it's the British Can day, huh? Yeah. <laughs> well, actually, I am one of those people. I am definitely one of those people that I try the British thing, and then it goes like Irish. And then oh, it goes yeah. like Italian and then it's like, sounds like Narnia. I don't, it just totally gets like way off, but I go for it. I give it, a, I do my best. Um, okay. So we got a cool show today. We got a cool show today. We do. Yes. It's always fun cool, to have. It could be, and it could be for English people. It could be for Irish people. It could be for Italian people. It's for all kind of people. Mm -hmm. It's like the gospel. The gospel okay. is for all, right? You just got to believe, right? So, okay, praise the Lord. <laughs> so we have we do have, uh, what do we got? We have two members on today, correcto? Two of our Unlocking Your Book members on today. Yes, we have Shirley and we have Jenny coming on to pitch a book and testify. Shirley Jenny is coming on. Shirley, Shirley Jenny. Jenny. Yeah. Well, hey, before we dive in to Shirley Jenny, I was just thinking, let's talk about overthinking and how we can overcome <laughs> overthinking. I don't know about you, but you know, like, I think we all do that. We all overthink things. We overthink life there. You know, we need to not take everything so seriously. Um, and writing a book is huge, man. I mean, it's like writing a book is like run running a marathon. You know, very few people decide to take the leap and jump in to run a marathon. I've never ran a marathon. My wife has, and that helped me decide I didn't want to run a marathon after watching her run a marathon. But a book can feel like that. And so, you know, for like in a marathon, we could overthink that too. We're like, oh my gosh, this is like, it's over 26 miles. I mean, I'm good. You want me to run and keep running for 26 miles? I could maybe do that over the span of five years if I really, really had to, but that's a lot of running. But there are running coaches that will teach you to not overthink and start really small. And they, they'll actually create a program for you so that almost anyone, almost anyone within three to six months, most people within four months can get coached by taking these little programs the, that are sp uh, specific to them. And within three or four or five months, they're ready to run over 26 miles. That's amazing. It is amazing. It's just, um, it's like I always try to say to my kids when they get overwhelmed, they're like, oh, I can't do this. I have to do this and this and this and this. And they make build this mountain out of what they have in front of them. And they're like, how am I going to do this? And I just look at them and I go, well, you just start. <laughs> Absolutely. Start, start doing yeah. it and stop overthinking it and worrying about all that has to be done. Just start. And then you'll have less to do than when you started. <laughs> yeah. And a plan. Mm -hmm. Have a plan that will help you during those processes and during during those times. So one of the one of the ways that we can overcome overthinking specifically to writing your book. OK, this is a way that you can overcome the overthinking of writing your book. Number one is don't focus on perfection. Mm 
Don't focus on your writing, your editing, on any of this process being perfect, especially if this is your first book. Because what's going to happen now, you're not going to train for a marathon perfectly. And really, who says what's perfect anyway? Who gets to decide what's perfect, what's not? There mm-hmm. certainly are absolutes in writing a book. But if you want to overcome the overthinking of writing your book, don't be so hard on yourself. Be patient with yourself and don't worry about perfection. That's number one. Number two, uh, stop thinking about what everybody else is thinking. You want to overcome overthinking about your book? Stop thinking about what everybody else is thinking. And in fact, they probably aren't thinking that Anyway, has that been your experience? Have you have have you ever overthought you know about what other people are thinking about? Oh, I'm going to dive into writing. And who do you think you are? Mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely. That was one of the biggest hurdles to overcome in unlocking my first book. Was that very thing? And I think that that's something that we all we all deal with. It's that voice, and yeah. um, and you can just move past that. You can just walk. You can just ignore that. And keep going because it just, even if they are thinking that you can go, well, then, but what does that matter? Right. Why would that even matter? Whether they are or aren't, does that, should Mm -hmm. that matter? (laughs) And it's important to, to recognize signposts and notifications in your own life that you are thinking about what other people are thinking. So when you catch yourself, catch yourself, right? That's, it's the, it's the, um, aware, being personally aware that you are thinking about what other people are thinking, which stunts your process. It stunts your growth, your growth. It is gross. It stunts your growth. It does it thinking about what other people are thinking does not get you further. It actually gets you farther. It actually gets you potentially even to stop in the process because you start to reason, you start to align, and you actually change your belief system. And if you change your belief system, you're going to change your values. And then all of a sudden, you no longer really feel like you're called to write that book. Yeah, and it- absolutely. And then and then, inadvertently, we end up elevating man's opinion over God's. That's just what happens. Oops. And Those are the things that I always say to myself. If I start valuing what other people think too highly and put weight in that, then I go, wait a second. I do this self-talk. You know, now all of a sudden this, what this person thinks is more important than what God thinks because God is telling me to do this and I'm feeling hindered because of person A, B or C over here. And, and it helps just deescalate that, um, Mm -hmm. that lie within and it deflates it. And then all of a sudden, you just go, oh, <laughs> you snap out of it and you keep going. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. That's good. I like that. De-escalate. I like that because because that's that's how the overthinking problem is. It starts to escalate and it builds. Yep. It creates steam. It creates momentum. And then you're worried and then you're freaking out and then you're freaking out everybody that's around you. Uh-huh. Right? So yep. De-escalate. Don't allow it to escalate. Notice and recognize that you're overthinking and that you're thinking about what other people are thinking and you're worried about this thing being perfect. Just sit with the lamb, obey the Lord and follow the plan and the process to run your marathon, run your race and write your book. Come on, somebody. Amen to that. Yes. Well, let's do this. Let's go say hi to Shirley. Now, what's uh, what's Shirley? Shirley's Shirley. Shirley's coming on. And what is Shirley? Is she pitching a book? What's she doing today? Shirley is coming on to share a testimony with us. Mm-hmm. <sighs> and the crowd goes wild. Okay, mm-hmm. fantastic. Well, let's do that. Shirley's coming on. Everybody, say hello, Shirley. <laughs> And we're back. Hi, Shirley. How are you? I'm doing great. How about you too? 
Fantastic. Yes. Where are you at right now? What's that behind you? Uh, I'm at, I'm at my church. <laughs> oh, wow. Awesome. I had a doctor's appointment and I didn't have time to get from that back home because I live way out in the country. So I just okay. brought my, took my computer with me and stopped at the church. <laughs> hey, wonderful. Yeah, I'm thinking, I'm like, man, Shirley has a pulpit in her living room. Dude, this, oh. this lady is serious. No. She's the real deal. I tried to block it, but everywhere I move my camera, it still shows. So there must be a no. reason for it. I like it. I like it. It looks good. It looks awesome. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, we're excited to have you on today, Shirley. And we are surely very excited. Sorry, I had to do it. Uh, to hear what testimony. Yeah, I know you're used to that. Um, we want to hear what is the testimony that you would like to share with us today? Okay. Uh, well, I told Liz, I, I said, I, I, don't, I can't tell you testimony or, or pitch my book because the book is my testimony. But uh, it is, it's, it's coming from a life, my testimony is coming from a life in early childhood of uh, a lot of neglect and abuse and, and uh, you know, 150 words or less. <laughs> Growing up and, and that continuing, you know, as a teenager and then into a marriage and, and other things I got involved in. And uh, for example, things were so bad and, and I write things in the book that I have never revealed before. Uh, I don't know if you watched any of my videos yet, but in one of them, my cousin, my first cousin commented and said, you know, we grew up together. We confided e each other. We were so close and you never told me what you were going through. And I said, no, I, I you know, sorry. I, kids just don't tell. They don't tell what's going on in their life. But uh, for example, things were so bad when I was about seven and my sister was about 10, we decided we were just going to end it. And we were just going to, we lived in a third story uh, rooming, ha rooming house, a little one room thing, but we were there alone most of the time, day and night. So we opened the window one day and we were just going to jump out. I mean, this is little girls thinking, you know, let's just, I, we couldn't take it anymore. We were just going to end it. And we actually crawled out on the window ledge. And the only thing that stopped us was we were so terrified that it wouldn't kill us. And then we would really be in trouble. We were more afraid of the adults in our lives, you know, and what they would do to us if we made a big hospital bill. It's so strange the way kids think. But a beautiful th testimony about that is when I, when I was grown and I was working on a, a workshop about uh, the danger of the words we speak for church, God gave me an open vision about that. And suddenly I was up high, like from his vantage point, and I could see, sorry, I'm trying not to get emotional. I could see those two little girls in the window and an angel guarding them and keeping them from falling out. But um, things like when my mother was there, she was always, uh, she was an alcoholic and she would just spend her time if she, when she wasn't passed out, just sit us on the couch and curse at us. You know, if it weren't for our blank kids, I could do this, if I could do this. If weren't for my, and uh, so many other things and a lot of things like you, you've taught us, you know, some things just don't need to be told. So there are a lot of things I, I'm not telling in the book and not going into a lot of details other than a quick summary like I just gave you, because I want it to be about the teaching. I want it to be about how that affected me. I mean, I had a nervous breakdown in fifth grade. I missed the whole last month, my fifth grade year because I was so sick. And it was just, that's, I guess that's why God gave me, or the Holy Spirit gave me the name of the book from insanity to salvation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm because I came through a whole life all the way up to young adulthood of those kinds of experiences. It's like, it's like everything that could happen to go wrong. Murphy's law was full effect in my life went wrong. And, uh, but look where I've come. God brought me out of it. I was delivered. I was so full of hate and bitterness as a teenager that my grandmother remarked one time that, 
told someone else who told me that I was the most unhappy teenager she had ever seen in her life. And everyone constantly told me that I had a death wish, you know, and I, and I really did, you know, I just didn't care whether I lived or died growing up. And wow, there's so many miracles in my life. I went over the side of a mountain in a wreck one time when I was a teenager with two stepsisters and in the middle of the night and we were just crashed and turned seat belts weren't in cars at that time. And so we were thrown all over the place and, it was black and I do write about this in the book. And when we got finally the car stopped and we were able to get a door open, we, we crawled up cause we knew we were going down in the wreck. So we crawled up even though we couldn't see to the road. And when it got daylight in a few hours and the, and the record crew pulled the car up, one of them came back to the house and said, I just had to come tell you there was nothing in front of that car to stop it three feet from a 200 foot cliff. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of miracles too that I that I plan to share because God just saved my life over and over and over. And wow. there's so much happiness that can be had and so much joy and so much peace when you let go of all that bitterness, hate and anger. And that's what the book will be about. And that's my testimony. Wow, Shirley. Oh my goodness. I love that you're in your church right now sharing this story. You know, I, it is such a beautiful picture of the power of God um, mm -hmm. to lead you through that into your path. Are you, do you pastor? Yes. Yeah. So this is your church that you pastor. And um, that's such a, a, a stamp right there. Mm -hmm. um, a, a visual for us to see as you're sharing this, this testimony um, of the goodness of God, um, the way he leads us, you know, to those quiet waters and he calms our soul yeah. and um, restores our life. Um, wow. So your, your book is going to share the story of your life. And then ultimately what, I mean, the title is pretty self-explanatory as far as what you've walked out of and into. What is your hope for your reader that you really want to, like, if you could take them by the hand and lead them through and out of anything, what are you yes. wanting to lead them out of and what are you wanting to lead them into? Yes. And then you've been asked me that. So I took notes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've been praying about it. I had written it before, but I just want to lead them to a place and the activations I hope will be, I plan to be um, taking one thing at a time, one person, one event, one situation in your life that that uh, caused pain and, and it still overwhelms you and, and you still think about it and you still get angry about it and you still mm -hmm. cannot forgive that person about it. I hope I can lead them to learn to take one thing at a time and just stop. Are you familiar with Sozo Ministry? I was just thinking about that. Mm -hmm. I've been through that and I've also been through the first training to, to help others through it. But it's stopping and thinking about that person, look at them or that situation as God saw it, yeah. as, as God sees them. Uh, think about what's motivating, motivating them uh, and learn to, to, that's their problem. That's their, you know, they will have to answer for those things. And we can't let it affect us on our life and just ask the Father, Holy Spirit, Lord Jesus, you know, ask them, what did I learn from this? Think about what you learned from it. Oh my gosh, I learned so much. I, I, am, I have no regrets, no bitterness. Uh, every trial I went through, as horrible as it was when I was young, um, I'm grateful for every one of them because now when I talk to people or something, they know I've been there. They know I've been through the fire uh, and some of them just can't believe how happy I am, how, uh, how I want to reach out, how I, I just want to, I just want it to go through me. Mm -hmm. I just want that river to flow through me to help others to let go of this. There are a lot of things that, that we all need to overcome, but hate and bitterness and anger will destroy you and it'll destroy everyone around you. And, and the bend goes on. If you don't change the bend, you go down the same road of hurting other people the way you were hurt. Mm -hmm. 
So and in good. some cases, it could cost our salvation, you know, and that's the big point right there. Yeah. So I want I want to teach them to be sensitive to the presence of the Lord, mm -hmm. to learn to really feel that presence, to learn to really hear from the Lord, to know when he's speaking to you and give him time to speak to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I feel that. I got <laughs> and a clear understanding of who they are. They're not the person, you know, I used to, I used to hate myself really more than I hated anyone else. I was so disappointed in myself because I could see, I could see some of the people in my past in me. I could see myself going down through that same road. And, you know, that's what I want them to understand. That's not who God created you to be. You have a, you have a destiny, you have a plan, you have a calling and you can step into that. Once mm -hmm. you learn to receive what he has for you and to let go of all those other things that he'll take care of, mm -hmm. he will, he'll take care of. Amen. Yeah. yeah. Well, surely I, uh, I feel God's presence just all over you. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I'm, I'm wondering what's your, what's your writing style? Like what, when you are writing and you're communicating and you're activating, what is that? style and that voice sound like because <clears throat> it should feel very much like it does right now yeah. for people and it should feel like they're sitting down in your living room just spending time with you and you are really writing to speaking to the one and as you're speaking to and you're writing to the one they feel the father's value. They feel the father's uncovering and unveiling. And you're, as you, through your writing, are taking them through that process of sozo. You're taking them through, while it may not be officially sozo, you're taking them through the inner healing, the deliverance, the unveiling, the unpacking, and really the discovering of who God created them to be. And yes, they went through these different things and maybe potentially go through different things, but you're, you're speaking to that one in this very, very motherly, you know, in nurturing and healing and speaking words of life. And I think it's interesting and, and I'm not trying to be spooky spiritual, but that you're there in your church with a, with a pulpit because unfortunately, and I don't mean this negative about anything or anyone or any ministry or, or any preacher, uh, but unfortunately, sometimes from the pulpit, we haven't done a great job of articulating and yeah. communicating the voice of Father. We've yeah. said the right words, but we haven't said it in the right spirit, and we haven't said it in the right tone. So rather than it actually moving people into a closer embrace of the Father, it moved them maybe potentially into a greater place of woundedness and healing. So uh, I just, I'm very conscious of your writing style and your writing voice to be, you know, and you're not behind the pulpit in this particular picture. You're out here in front and you're communicating and you're pastoring and you're shepherding. And, you know, Jesus talks about this, or I should say the gospel of John talks about this, where Jesus goes to the gatekeeper of the pen and he goes into the pen to lead the sheep out of the pen into open pastures. And so I see that kind of as your voice and as your style that you're going in and you're leading people out of the pen. You're, lead, they're, you're leading them outside of that place into a broad, open place so that they can have the embrace of their father. You know, it's interesting that you say that because I've never spoken behind that pulpit. <laughs> that was my sister's. And that's one reason I was trying to angle to kind of cover it up a little bit because I'm a teacher. You know, that's what I'm called for. And when, when my tiny, and it is a tiny congregation because my ministry is most online, but when we gather here, uh, we're at the tables and we're sitting down together and we're digging into scripture and we're interacting and we're questioning each other and, and, uh, 
and that's the way I teach. I, and I tell them from the beginning when they start coming, I said, I just want you to understand, I am not a behind the pulpit preacher. I am a teacher. And that's the way I write. I, I, I was in a classroom for many, many years and I, and I interacted with my students. I never lectured. And that's, that's the way I write. So it's interesting that you brought that up. Thank you, because that validates what I was concerned about. But I just, I just talk in my book like I'm talking to you right now. That's it. Good. That's yeah. It. That's so powerful. And yeah, I just second everything he just said. And you made it clear when you were sharing that you were truly writing to the one. And that can be a challenge for some. And I love that it's not for you. I love that that's like your core value and your mission in writing a book is that you're writing to the one. And that's how I know you're gonna reach the one. Yeah. And you're gonna reach, you know, many ones. Right. Um, but keep doing what you're doing. Keep, please feel so affirmed in your writing voice uh, that if you're writing the way that you've communicated with us today, that's a book I want to read. That's Absolutely. a book that's safe. And that's what people who your target audience, that's, they need to feel that safety and they need to feel that maternal love and those arms wide open and that shepherding. And that's what you're giving them when you communicate in that real authentic voice. That's you, you know, mm -hmm. um, and you can have so much fun writing when mm -hmm. you allow yourself the freedom to write just as you would um, you would talk to people. So keep doing that, Shirley. We're so thankful to hear this. This is this is what we're wanting to help unlock in people and you're you're doing it. So thank you. Thank you. And I appreciate so much what I've learned from you guys in our original interview with you, Jeremiah, where you helped me with because I was so afraid the writing would hurt someone in my past and you helped me through that. And then Chrissy and your teachings you explained and I forget which module of the mechanics, but you were talking about not really mentioning the person by name or anything. Just talk about how it affected you. And I thought, oh, that's the answer, God. I, that's what I needed to hear. So that's what I've tried to do. That's awesome. Yeah. I appreciate that very much. Well, we love you. Love you too. Yeah. Thank you so much, Shirley. Thank you for your boldness, your bravery, your courage and your strength and your joy. Just uh -huh. God speak to you. <laughs> Yeah. What's your what's your time frame? Where are you at in your writing and publishing process? No pressure. I'm just curious. Yeah. You know, I I, I was telling my friend the other day, I, she was asking me that. And I said, I have so many documents. <laughs> you know, I'm telling a story on this one. I'm telling a story, but I haven't really compiled it yet and added the scriptures and added the activations. But I would say about a third, maybe. And God keeps giving me things. I made a video uh, called You Are Not a Stepchild. And you probably haven't seen it, but uh, that I never planned to be in the book. But the Holy Spirit gave that to me. And, and I just went online and, made, you know, I, I made a video about it. I think I recorded it because I'm not that brave. And then I posted it and that became a chapter. So he's feeding into me as I go what to put into it, but I have a lot of things written. I just don't have it. I don't know where it goes yet. Yeah, yeah. you will. I'm still writing because he's still giving me things. Yeah. yeah. You know, I just heard this when you said that in my spirit, that you're breaking the orphan spirit. That's what your, your life is doing. That's what your book is doing, breaking the orphan spirit. So everybody know that, like that's a nugget from the Lord to know as you're writing, this is breaking that orphan spirit. And then you can just keep writing. You can write into that. You can like target that spirit as you write and know that you're disarming it and dismantling it off of people. Um, yeah. And then the other thing too, because I never felt like I belonged. Yeah. You're, you're doing it. You carry that. It's on your life. And then the thing about the table, I just, there's something about that at the table when you said you sit at tables with people. Um, I don't know what that looks like, but it's like, I just saw a series of at the table, at the table with Shirley, at the table, at the table, um, you know, and here and we're today at the table, we're gonna talk about this. Today at the table, we're gonna talk about that. Um, 
I love that. There's just something on on that too. I wanted to circle back to. It was in my heart. <laughs> Thank you. That's good. Yeah. So love you, Shirley. Yeah, Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Shirley. We bless you. Thanks for coming on today. <laughs> God bless you for all you do. Thank you, Bob. Uh, you're so welcome. Bye bye. Uh, so good. Oh, goodness. Yeah. That's Once someone I just could like hang on to her and spend. I could just sit at the table with her all day and go yeah. on and on. Uh, yeah. Man. Yeah. You, y'all watching, listening, you're going to want to get Shirley's. You're going to want to get Shirley's book for yeah. sure. Absolutely. All right. We got Jenny coming on. Who's ready? Let's rock and roll. Let's do this. <laughs> Hey, 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 Jenny, Hello. how are you? Hi, I'm so excited. Oh my goodness, I can't uh, believe I'm doing this. You guys awesome. are amazing. Oh. You are such a gift from God to the body of Christ. You are so amazing. Oh, yeah. well, thank you. Oh, oh man. I appreciate I, that. I, <laughs> Jesus loves what you're doing. Oh. <laughs> Thank but you. Every single person that's been on just, oh my gosh, I just love them so much and just yeah. want to get their books. And I can see why you're doing this. And um, my whole thing is loving and embracing the body of Christ like Jesus does, his bride. Mm -hmm. And um, <laughs> and it just keeps coming more and more. Mm, that's um, yeah. And What's all that behind it, you? Is that your artwork? So I am an artist. And at the same time of unlocking my book, I'm also unlocking my art. Wow. <laughs> and awesome. so I get distracted in every time. So that's, I asked a question once what, if we can include our art, because I basically for every chapter really have a painting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the painting itself explains the whole chapter. So mm -hmm. um, kind of like a visual artist, yeah. um, visual mm -hmm. storyteller. <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, yeah. So that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. So you're pitching your book today. Is that right? I'm pitching my book. And I'm telling you, it, it was a huge battle just to get on today sure. i think liz will testify to that <laughs> um but here i am here you and are I, I, actually, you're here. I actually almost gave up and the lord just said well this isn't for you to give up this is my thing not yours <laughs> so yeah. yeah that's good we got to contend for what we're called to do so good yes. for you jenny yes now tell us a little bit about your book what genre are you writing it's nonfiction. Okay. So it's, um, wow. There's just, there's so much to it. <laughs> um, I, let me start with when I returned to the Lord, because that's when, yeah. So it's kind of starts in the middle. <laughs> um, I had, well, there was just this, this moment, a year before that, I had realized that I wasn't really walking with the Lord very much and um, hadn't even read my Bible or anything. And we weren't going to church or anything. And so something happened where it just really, I realized, wow, I better get my Bible out. So I dug it out of the garage and started reading and then kind of thought, that, okay, I'm okay. And um, it, we... So, so then um, about a year and a half later, when I was just in that place, kind of like a lukewarm Christian, um, where I spent a little bit of time with the Lord every day and read the Bible um, and would share the gospel if the opportunity arose, but I did not have that intimate 
relationship with Jesus. Um, and then, and this was because, okay, I, I have, he's 31 now. Um, Noah, my fourth child, um, has cerebral palsy. So he at the time was uh, about 15. And this is, since he was born, um, it was very difficult to go to church. Um, and we had moved away from our fellowship um, down to Southern California from Tahoe. So we, um, so, so when he was little, um, even though we had moved, I tried to go to church. I mean, when he was like a year old um, and he was so sensitive, um, it, he just started screaming and I couldn't, I, I couldn't, oh shoot. I went black. Hold on. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to have to keep tapping this cause it'll go off on its own. Um, as, so anyways, he's real sensitive and I had to carry him all the time. He had cerebral palsy and, um, um, boy, I'm losing my train of thought all the time. So anyways, um, I couldn't pray around him. I couldn't go to church. If I started praying and I used to lead worship. So if I started singing, he would just come unglued. I mean, hysterically get upset. So it, you know, I, not knowing, okay, what is this? Why, you know, I just kind of shut up and, um, and then kind of shut down. And then, uh, before you know it, 15 years had passed and I was it, it pretty much had a name that I was alive, but I was dead. So then, so then that's the background to take you to when I woke up in the Lord, Noah's 15, he's a little more mature, able to handle uh, emotional things. And he started liking music. Before that, I couldn't ever put any kind of music on. And so um, I thinking that, okay, I'm, I'm a Christian and I wonder now it had been 15 years since I was in touch with the body of Christ, with the church, thinking I was a Christian, but not listening to the radio, not listening to Christian music, nothing. Just having my Bible. And <laughs> so I thought, I wonder what Christian music sounds like now. You know, let's find a station. No, I want to listen to music now. Let's find a good Christian station. And anyway, so during the, the after about a month of having the music on and reading my Bible every day, all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit spoke to me so strongly and just told me, you've been an adulterer to me. So here's God telling me I have been an adulterer to him, which brought the fear of God upon me in such a way I just was like weeping. Um, it was actually over a two week period that I was just like constantly weeping. I remember even just starting to wear sunglasses <laughs> all the time because I didn't want anybody to see my swollen eyes. But at the same time, the Holy Spirit was pouring so much grace upon me and so much love. It's just like he was cleansing me. So coming back to the Lord, we had just moved to Phoenix and God completely set things up where all the people in my life then were on fire believers. <laughs> like this came from 15 years of not being in touch with, with the kingdom to everything was about it from Noah's coordinator that um, coordinated his therapies would, came to my house and it was right after I woke up in the Lord. And I mean, this was drastic wake up. It's like, I felt like I was born again, again, and baptized in the Holy Spirit. And, um, and it, so his coordinator was a on fire believer. He was actually a Baptist pastor, but he was baptized in the Holy Spirit. And it, this was his side 
he was a pastor, but this was his side job because he just had a little tiny church <laughs> being a coordinator for therapies. Anyways, um, so I then I got in touch with my old friend who was um, assistant pastor in the, from the church way before um, that we had gone to. And she told me, you got to get in touch with Elijah List and you got to get in touch with IHOP and um, so I started having International House of Prayer on all the time. And I mean, this is when internet was, you know, 14 years ago when internet was really picking up and you were watching things live and stuff. And so I was really locked into that. I mean, all day. And I remember standing in my kitchen one day, just, just shortly after I had really woken up and I said, I need to be very intentional about holding on to who I am in Christ and not let my mind wander at all from knowing him, from seeing him, from feeling him. And ever since that, you know, it's like you kind of wander in that, oh, what am I thinking? And, you know, because I hadn't thought of him for 15 years. And so I didn't want a second to go by that I wasn't thinking about him. And so, so then the main thing is that's just kind of my testimony. But what happened was the church that I left, I was so disgruntled about. I didn't like this person that nobody was good enough. Nobody walked with the Lord good enough because I was really on fire for the Lord before I got married, actually. <laughs> then I got domesticated. But I had a very critical spirit. And... Um, you know, judge this one and that one. And so the Lord started. So it's like there weren't any ministries out there that I really wanted to connect with because I had such a critical spirit. It's like there was always something wrong with everything. And so God started talking to me about every single person that I had a problem with and showed me either a, a, a video of them getting interviewed. And he just had me see his heart for them. And I started learning how the body of Christ is really a part of me. Like I can't separate myself from these people. Um, and so whenever I would hear something negative, cause then, you know, I started, you know, you look up a ministry and then you, you hear something negative about that ministry too, it would like really hurt my heart. And I was just feeling God's heart. It's like, what do I do with this? You know, and he would, if, so right about that time in the beginning as he, I mean, he was taking logs out of my eye and, and 11, <laughs> you know, the 11 of the Pharisees that I like no way ever thought that I, was like that, <laughs> but he was like relentless in every, just showing me his love for people. Um, and then he brought to my attention as I'm an artist and in the past, I, I would get books about vineyards cause I like to paint vineyards. And I got these books just for the pictures so I could paint pictures. I had one and he, one day just told me to look, look at this book. And I opened it to a page that it had this paragraph about this Phloxera bug that ruined, I, have you ever heard of this? <laughs> okay, all of the vineyards in the 1800s in Europe were destroyed. All of the, almost like 80% of all the vineyards. and wine was just about to be an end to it jenny we lost your um, audio and so it came from the united states now this is the 1800s later 1800s so it came from the united states from uh they had they had um, grown some some grapevines there, brought them from Europe, started growing them in, in the United States. And then 
and then they shipped them. This guy had a had a uh, nursery, and he, he started shipping some of these grapevines to Europe. Now, so when the bugs started killing all the vineyards, somehow someone found out, figured out um, that that's where the bug came from. Now, so they tried everything for a period of about 20 years, everything to get rid of this bug. No kind of pesticide, nothing would get rid of it. And this bug would mutate from a um, crawling to a creeping to a gnawing um, it, on the roots. And that's what would kill the vineyards. So miraculously, <laughs> They found out after trying everything, this guy in the, in the United States found out that if they took the wild grapevine, that the wild grapevines in the United States did not, uh, this bug did not bother them. It had, the wild grapevine had a root that the bugs could not harm. Hmm. And so all of the, the, it took a lot for them to, to convince them because the Europeans had a dislike for the American grapevines because they're the ones that brought the bug. I don't know if you're seeing the parallel here, but as God was showing me this, I saw the parallel of how they, they brought the bug and they, so they didn't want to have anything to do with the American vine, but this guy convinced them to try it because he grew some grapevines and lo and behold, they did not die from the bug. Okay. So Jenny, I'm going to interrupt just real that, quick. I kind of tucked it away. Jenny, just yes. real, real quick. Um, Cause we okay, have about, we have about eight minutes left here. Oh, okay, um, sorry. So I want to just kind of steer the conversation a little bit to the book pitch. You don't have to be sorry. Uh, okay. But just uh, just be aware, we've only got a few minutes right. left here. So that's where the wild thing comes in, because my book is called <laughs> Hearing and Answering the Call of the Wild. <laughs> There's just so much. I didn't know what part to tell. Um, okay, so if you, so, there's a lot of um, Jesus started showing me that there's a lot of. Uh, division in the body of Christ. And actually, I am in the middle of it. Um, because I'm very charismatic. And that's a stream I came back into. My husband is like John MacArthur, <laughs> kind of, you know what I mean? I'm very against, even though in the past, we were charismatic. So he's he's been very against everything that I do um, to the point where he just considers we don't even have a marriage anymore um, because I won't listen to him and distance myself from these people that he thinks is false teachers. So it took a lot for me that's gone on for 14, 14 years, um, actually 10 years because two years I was on fire then he um, he was completely backslidden. And then after a couple of years, he just came back to the Lord after he had left me for two years. Then he came back to the Lord and said, okay, we're going to move back in together, but you're not going to have anything to do with these people. <laughs> so, so for 10 years, I kept it um, under wraps and tried to be submissive, submissive to him. And then just recently, this last year, I was just like, realize, wow, that submission is not that. It's not him telling me what my mind, how, how I hear from God. Um, and so it's, it's really a big deal about hearing from God. So it's, 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 so hearing God's voice is a big deal in the, in the book. Remind me and the title then, again. Uh, the wild part is knowing who to listen to. And it took a lot for me to realize that listening to God and answering his call and doing what he wants me to do is more important. And what was the and title of your book again, Jenny? 
It's a wild adventure. Hearing and answering the call of the wild. The call of the wild. Fascinating. So I'll tie in the whole thing about the wild root because it is really actually what fixed um, all the, the all of the grapevines in Europe okay. are rooted from the American vine. Mm -hmm. I know it's crazy. But it, it, to me, the American vine represents, okay, Jesus is the root. Jesus is the root. And we all need to get back to the root and who, who he is. And we all have him in common. So I feel like, the, like, a mother, mm -hmm. um, like a mother in the church looking at her children fighting against each other. And it's like in, in Israel when... Um, in Ezekiel, when it talks about his, um, you know, pouring the oil, what was I? Oh, oh, oh the two, the two sticks. Ezekiel thirty-seven, um, take the two sticks and put them together. Do you know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. um, and it was talking about you know Judah and Ephraim, and put them together. I mean that's. And to me, that's like the charismatics and the evangelicals, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. Um, Jenny, question for you um, in regards to this book. I can't hear you. Where, where are you taking? Where am I? I am, no, I am in a mess with where, my book. Not where I am you. very scattered. <laughs> and I'm trying to yeah. organize. Jenny, hold on. Just hold on just a second. Hold on just a second. Um, so I, I agree with you. Uh, I agree with you that you are scattered and I want to help you get unscattered. Okay. Um, so you, you have, a, you have a, a lot of things going on here and you have a really deep, deep understanding of the Father's love for you and the Father's love for the body of Christ. You've gone through this process You've gone through this process where God showed you uh, bitterness, anger, different things that you, and resentment that you had towards things and towards people and towards systems and things of that nature. Yeah. So while you're going through those processes, and I'm not sure exactly where you're at in all of that, you don't want to necessarily be writing about that until you have really gotten the healing that you need, but then also getting the correct application. Like as you're writing your story, always remember this, that somewhere, somehow the story and the script has to be flipped. So for example, if you want people to listen and you want people to pay attention and you want people to engage with this revelation, with the message, you have yeah. to take them somewhere, yeah. right? You have to take them from where they're at, wherever that is, to a place where they now have victory over that. Yeah. So in your writing, you have to remember, and, and I know sometimes this is, this is hard for writers and authors, but this book is not about you. The book is not about the writer's, is really not even about the writer's story. Writers and authors that have the mindset that this book is about me and is about my story sell very few books and usually don't publish more than one, especially mm -hmm. if, they're, if they're, they want a publisher to publish it. And here's why. It sounds mean, but people don't care. Yeah. People, people really don't care. And people, people want to be able to identify with some of the things you've been through, but then they want very quickly to know that you can lead them out. Yes. So you have to be able to um, gather your thoughts and organize those thoughts and then organize the message in such a way that you are most definitely sure that you've come out and are going into that's first because yeah. you can't give away what you don't have. And then second, that you can articulate clearly where you're taking people out and taking mm -hmm. them into. 
Yes. So here's my challenge for you. Um, and almost all writers and authors do this, you know, really, really good, really, really polished writers and authors. Eventually they get there and they understand this. You mm -hmm. should be able to tell people in about a hundred to 200 mm -hmm. words in about 60 to 90 seconds, what the entire thing is about. Right. Okay. So, and, and if you can't, that's okay. That just means you're just not there yet. Yeah. And that, 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 that's okay. That means you're still figuring out what you're coming out of and what Jesus is taking you into. But if you want the book and not just the book to sell, but you want the message in the book to be clear enough to help people like God has helped you, right? You, God, I mean, God spoke a pretty, pretty heavy word to you about, Hey, uh, Jenny, you're living the life of an adulterer. You know, there was spiritual adultery there. That's a hard word to hear. And that's a hard word to react and respond to. And you reacted to it. And, no, excuse me. You didn't react. You responded correctly by opening yourself to the Lord and letting him mold you and take you. So as you do that, those are powerful, powerful messages. Those types of nuthetic encounters when the Lord, when the Lord comes like a loving father and doesn't just, you know, stroke you on the back and say, oh, everything's okay, because that's really not how God works. He really comes like a father to correct us so that we can grow, right? A father that just says, that just pats you on the back and tells you everything's going to be okay. That's a good dad, but not a really great father because that's not real. Yeah. That's not practical. A real father, a real father will show you where you can grow, where you can improve, and he'll show you how to get there. So here's my challenge. My challenge for you is that to really clearly identify the things that God has uh, obviously done in you. He's given you some revelation and the revelation he's given you has come out of those times when the father has come in and interjected you face to face and spoken things, done things and brought you out of things. And my challenge to you would be to clearly be able to identify two or three of those things that have just, they have rocked you. So that time when the Lord came to you and he said, Jenny, you're living the life of an adulterer. Exhaust that. Write about that. Write yeah. all the good, the bad, the ugly, the blood. Okay. The, exhaust it. Exhaust that whole thing. And then exhaust all the feelings, all the emotions, how you felt before, what life was like before, all the stinky, all the nasty, all the gross. And then when God came in and said, Jenny, you're living this life as an adulterer. And what did that look like? What did that, did you cry? Did you weep? Did you fast? What did you feel like? Were you in turmoil? You, you said you felt the fear of the Lord. Talk about that. And then talk about the emotions and the process that God brought as he brought you out of spiritual adultery and took you into intimacy and exhaust that. Mm -hmm. That is a message. That is a, that is a message. And, you know, I, I appreciate the other things you were talking about, like, you know, the, the roots and the, the, the wine and the French and the history. Those are all really good, <laughs> but, but, and that's important to you and it might be important to other people. But I'll tell you, if you can hone in on that one experience, Jenny, you're living in spiritual adultery and you felt the fear of the Lord. If you can hone in on that process and then the process that God took, took you out and is taking you out and clearly be able to communicate that, then people are going to want to hear that message and need yeah. to. People yeah. really do need to hear that. Because I think, Jenny, I think there's a okay. lot of people out there that are stuck like you were. I think there's a lot of people, they don't, they don't necessarily, we use the word adultery. It's kind of like, that's a really gross word, right? It's, mm -hmm. And it's a really gross word in the church. And so 
uh, spiritual adultery, God uses that terminology. We know what physical, natural, marital adultery is, and that's gross and that's nasty. That's, 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 that's foul. But spiritual adultery, God is comparing that. That's really deep. And I think that there's, there's a lot of people that are doing it, and a lot of it's just ignorance. A lot of it's just hurt. A lot of it's pain and wounds and different types of things like that. And unfortunately, sometimes even physical adultery and marital adultery is people are just, they're just dysfunctional in their own life. And so I feel like if you can hone in on that encounter that you had, and then in about 150 to 200 words, you can describe that you have a message that you can build off of. And then the other things that, that you started talking about and the things you were talking about and the things you were going to talk about, those will just enhance the message. But the core of the message, the whole core yeah. of this whole thing is Jenny, mm -hmm. you're in spiritual adultery and you, the fear of the Lord came on you and, mm -hmm. and aha, you had this aha. And now look at you. Now look at you. You're free. You're laughing. You're smiling. You're full of the joy of the Lord. And, you know, not everything in your life is perfect as you would want it or happen. But you're still laughing and you're still loving God and you're still loving people and you're still seeing where the cross needs to be applied to your life. And the paintings behind you is an expression of the Lord. It's an expression of heaven. It's an expression of the journey of God taking you out of spiritual adultery and taking you into spiritual intimacy. Yeah. That's what they're doing. You're painting the expression of the spiritual intimacy that God has given with you. Mm -hmm. And so as, as a writing mentor, as a publisher, mm -hmm. and as a friend, my encouragement for your book is hone in and laser focus on that encounter because that encounter and, and and like don't 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 do anything else don't do anything else for for a while <laughs> just really get down to the nitty gritty nuts and bolts of that one encounter because that is a powerful encounter and i wish we had more people that would be vulnerable like you i wish we would have more people that would be willing to share that and express that because that's a little scary. You know, we don't like to go, oh, uh, yeah, hey, God told me I was an adulterer. You know, we don't sign up for that. But what God will do for this, God will do through this, is he will teach you how to spiritually focus on that encounter. And I love this word, exhaust the encounter. So yeah. I'm looking at some of your paintings. I can't see them really, really well, but I see detail. And so just how in your painting, your paintings have to have that detail, right? The it, Be exhaustive in the detail of this encounter and in this, uh, uh, in this story because your vulnerability, your transparency, and your joy will become the message just like your paintings. And then as far as, and I know you mentioned it way in the beginning, I can see you painting some of the illustrations of your chapters, of this encounter. And I love it. And I think not only will you sell the book because it's got this message of spiritual adultery, Father God encountering and bringing you out of adultery into intimacy, I can also see people buying the paintings because they <laughs> tell a story and there's a message behind it. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Very helpful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you are well, so originally I was going to do um, it, the book about spiritual adultery, but there you go. Um, I don't know. Maybe I overthought it, or maybe I just have a lot of books down the road, mm -hmm. yeah. and I was trying yeah. to put it all in one. You don't have to get it all in one. It's just like your painting. <laughs> right. you focus on That's one right. painting. Yeah, and you paint that, and then uh -huh. you know, because you know you're going to do another one. So just let yourself. Right. Let yourself know that you're going to write more than one and really hone in on that, like he said. And that's powerful. That's that we all need to hear how we can take the word of the Lord with humility and grace versus getting offended at God. And so many yeah. have gotten offended at God. And yeah. it's like, how did you not? What was that like? Did you were you tempted? I'm not asking you to answer this now. I'm just giving you something probing. Um, 
you know, that you can address in your book, how you didn't get offended with God, or did you, were you for a minute, a second, 10 minutes? What was that like? And then how did you move past that? And how did you tell a secret though, or shape you and not break you, you know? So we think I just want to tell a secret because I think people need to hear this. Um, I've, I've gone through 14 years of probably not, not very many people could, could make it through it as much in love with Jesus and people as I have. And I have to say it's because in the very beginning, coming back to the Lord, I heard someone speak on speaking in tongues and I spoke in tongues before and to encourage me to do it all the time. That is what saved me through all of this. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Speak in tongues all the time. And that's the key to not overthinking things too. Praise Although God. You do keep getting more revelation <laughs> and then you have yeah. too much. Right? Yeah. Uh, I just, thank you. I, I think so there's a little too little said about that in the body of Christ. And it is such an amazing tool. It's a, it is an amazing tool. So, yeah. Amen. Jenny, you're, you're a, uh, <laughs> you're, Jenny, you're a beautiful daughter in the Lord. Mm-hmm. Okay? You are, you, you are so a beautiful much. daughter in the Lord. You are so precious to him. His life, uh, or excuse me, his hand is on your life. He has given you a tremendous mm-hmm. gift. And I, again, I just, I can't wait to read and hear more about this laser focused story yeah. about God taking you out of spiritual adultery and yeah. into intimacy. Mm-hmm. And I look forward to hearing and, okay. and seeing more of that. And mm-hmm. thank, thank you so much. This has thank been you. very helpful. Good. <laughs> thank you for being transparent. Yeah. Um, and well, I'm then, glad I kind of went off on all those stories because okay. you helped me to hone in on what really matters. So, yeah. and those stories, they're important. No, they're good. Yeah. But, but, but they, they, they are just the, they're just like the, 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 uh, the yeah. sprinkles right. on the donut. It's yes. not the core. The core message yeah has to be something that people can quickly understand yeah. and quickly determine, am I going to let Jenny take me out of this and into? And that's what people are looking for. So yeah. we love you. Appreciate you. Thank you. you. Yeah, be you guys. Come on, Jenny. Thank Bless you, you so much. Take Bless care. You. It's good. It's good. Mm-hmm. It's, um, it is important to be vulnerable like that. And I, I just, again, want to commend uh, Jenny for being vulnerable like that. That's not, that's not easy to be vulnerable about your past and even about your present to mm-hmm. like, this is really what I'm going through. This is really what I'm dealing with. That's hard. Most of us just, it's not necessarily like we have so much pride that we don't want people to know. It's that we've got um, We've got these protections. We've got these things that kind of keep us safe. And if I expose too much, then maybe these people won't like me. Maybe these people won't love me. And sometimes we even do that with God. You know, we've been, we've been, um, you know, we were, we were raised by imperfect parents and, and, and the show must go on and it will always be that way. There's never going to be a perfect dad or a perfect mom or a perfect parent or a perfect couple or a perfect family. It's never existed and never has. And, and, you know, I'm, I'm not glad that they fell in the garden, but you know, Hey, the very first family that God created, they were messed up. (laughs) They're super dysfunctional and they really, really blew it. They blew it to each other. And we're never, ever going to be a perfect person and we're never going to have a perfect family. And the sooner that we can get that, the sooner we can settle it and just say that, you know, we're going to love unconditionally and we're going to do life unconditionally and we are going to blow it. Mom's going to blow it. Dad's going to blow it. Spouse is going to blow it. Kids are going to blow it. It's that's, that's life. That's the way it is. Mm -hmm. And so, but sometimes because of that, we want to have these protections we want to have these things that um, make us look better than we really are or make us look better than we're really doing. So I can appreciate yeah. that kind of transparency. And that's the kind of transparency that will get you healed. 
Yep. That being poor in spirit and being that kind of broken, not just not just that you can weep in the presence of the Lord or that you can humble yourself in the presence of the Lord, but that kind of openness and that kind of transparency, it means that there's a humility. And the word says that if you humble yourself in the sight and under the hand of the Lord, he will lift you up. Mm-hmm. And so that means there is a transition. He's going to change you. you. Your life could be a mess. I mean, a total wreck. You can like be like functioning on three brain cells. There's so much dysfunction in your life. And when you humble yourself before the Lord, he's going to exchange. He's going to give a divine exchange and he's going to start to lift you up. And then all of the things and the people and the circumstances and situations that snubbed their nose at you before, you'll be in a different place. And you'll be in a place where you could snub your nose, but you won't want to and you won't care because you're different. You're changed. So transparency is powerful. And I know I'm just preaching to the choir right now, but I just I commend Jenny and I commend anybody else that will be vulnerable like that and be transparent like that. God heals that. God loves that. God appreciates that. And it's 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 precious. It's Mm -hmm. precious in the sight of the Lord. Absolutely. That's the key to writing a really good book is that first that authenticity, that willingness to be transparent, that yes. that being a foundation, that's that's a springboard into a phenomenal book that will change lives. So and people will listen. Mm-hmm. That that's that's what's happening on our planet right now. I'm so thankful for it. Yeah. You know, thank you, Lord, for pulpit ministries and, and 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 big stages and lights and all of that. That's all good and all great, but that can't be our focus anymore. We can't we can't be stargazing. We need to be Jesus gazing. Mm-hmm. So anyway, thank you, Jenny. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, everybody, for being with us today. We'll be back same back that bat time, same bat channel, and Jenny. Go out there and figure out that encounter. Exhaust it with the Lord and let's get it published. We love you guys. Take care. God bless. Bye-bye for now.